So this section is about time frequency analysis. And uh, if you've done time frequency uh, analysis in the past, this might be a bit boring. But it, it could also be a good uh, refresher. And every, sing every time frequency analysis uh, presentation is different anyway, because you can look at it from so many angles. So you must still learn something. So this is how uh, usually uh, brainwave, EG brainwaves are defined. So you have very low frequency, 0 0.5 to 2 hertz uh, called delta, 4 to 7 hertz called theta, 9 to 11 alpha, and you have alpha low, alpha high, beta 18 to 21, and gamma 30 to 60. And it depends on the offers. And uh, usually, if you write a paper, it's always better to put the exact frequency range you mean, because different offer mean different things. And obviously, these are idealized uh, uh, sinusoids. The real brain waves look more like this. So here's low delta. Here is delta, and you can see a bit of beta right here. Theta is a little bit faster here, five oscillations per second. Alpha would be higher amplitude and about 10 oscillations per second, and beta would probably look something like this. And gamma, you're usually not able to see it on the, on, uh, when you just look at the raw data waves. You will have to filter the data. So here we're moving into the theory. So here's a sinusoid at 2 hertz, a sinusoid at 10 hertz, sinusoid at 20 hertz. We do this plus this plus this, and we get this signal. So this is a mixture of these three signals. And basically what you do then is that you compute the power spectrum, and you recover. So you, you get three peaks, one at 2 hertz, one at 10 hertz, one at 20 hertz. So that's exactly the signal you put in. So this is, this is what the power spectrum is for, is to try to uncover the underlying uh, uh, frequencies in the signal. This is a, uh, this is a time domain, EG, and he, X here is the time, and F to X is the uh, EG amplitude. And uh, basically, when you do a frequency decomposition, it's going to decompose and a different, the signal at different frequencies with different amplitude. So uh, we would have here, for instance, this signal corresponds to uh, uh, some power at this frequency. So this is going to be higher amplitude than uh, this, for instance. This is in the trough. So this is, this is very low amplitude at this frequency. And, and so this is how you can, you can uh, uh, see your signal. This peaks here represents the amplitude of different frequencies. And, and when you combine all these, all these uh, sinusoids here, you can recover the uh, original signal. You, there is one more caveat here, and it's the, the relative offset here at the beginning. It's called the phase. So you have both the amplitude and the phase. And when you recombine all of these, you can recover your original signal. This is your uh, original uh, signal. So this is a dual representation of your signal. Your signal can be represented in the time domain like this, or it can be represented in the frequency domain like, like this, where you just have two information. You have the original offset here of the first uh, peak of the sinusoids, and then you have the amplitude of the sinusoid. <coughs> now, uh, so this is our uh, EEG signal. And what we're going to do, we're just going to select the window and we're going to try to do uh, time frequency decomposition on uh, this moving window. So we use a sinusoid, and then we multiply it by a Gaussian to obtain a tapered sinusoid. And what I'm going to say here uh, is more for uh, the uh, classical Fourier transform, and then we're going to talk about wavelengths. So, uh, here is my EEG signal, idealized EEG signal, and here is my tapered sinusoid, and basically uh, I get two of them. I get one for the sinusoid and one for the cosine. And uh, I have what I call a real and imaginary part. And if you don't remember real imaginary number, uh, it's not that important. You just have to uh, remember that this here 
uh, uh, this, the convolution of this with the data is going to give me uh, the axis on uh, the value on the first axis, and the convolution of this with the data is going to value on the second axis. So here I have my signal, and I'm going to multiply by the real part of my uh, tape versus sinusoid. So here you see the peaks are aligned, so I multiply this number by this number, and I get a positive number. Here the negative, uh, the negative peaks are aligned as well, so I multiply this by this, I'm going to get a, a positive number as well. So I multiply all of these numbers by all of these numbers one by one here, and I sum over all of these numbers, this is what's called a convolution, and uh, I get a large positive number just because I have perfect alignment. Here, on the contrary, here I have zero, so I multiply zero by the maximum peak, and I get zero. And here I have a negative part, and here I have a positive part, and you can see that this is symmetric, so this, when I multiply this by the signal and this by the signal, they are going to cancel out. So when I multiply all of these numbers, some will be positive, some will be negative, and in the end I do the sum, I'm going to obtain zero. So the axis right there, I'm going to have a large positive number on this axis, and on the ordinate I'm going to have zero. So this is convolving with this specific signal. Now I move my window a little bit, and my signal changed a little bit as well. So this is now in my signal, you can see the amplitude is smaller. And now I'm going to multiply, again, exactly the same tapered sinusoid with my signal. Now it's aligned with 0, so I'm going to multiply this positive value with 0. It's going to give me 0. And uh, you can see this is symmetric, and this is anti-symmetric. So when I multiply this number by the signal and this number by the signal, they're going to cancel each other. One will be positive, the other one will be negative. So when I do the convolution, I'm going to get... Uh, I'm going to get zero on this axis, zero on the real axis. Uh, however, with the imaginary part, you can see that now the signals are aligned. So I multiply this positive number by this positive number, this negative number by this negative number. I do the sum for all the numbers, and I get a positive number. And now this is my time frequency estimate. And uh, you can see here the length is smaller than here. Why? Because my signal is of lower amplitude. So the length, the length of your vector indicates the amplitude of uh, the signal. And the orientation of the vector uh, indicates what we call the phase. So it's the red phase of your signal with your uh, tapered sinusoid. So let's, let's do a last example. Now I have a third signal, and uh, I'm not crossing here at 0. I'm not crossing on the peak. I'm crossing in the middle. So I'm going to convolve this uh, real part with the signal. I'm going to have a small positive number. I'm going to convolve this imaginary part with the signal. I'm going to have a small imaginary number. And this is basically what I get. So I get uh, orientation here, which is in between uh, the, the, this axis and the vertical axis. And the length here still indicates the amplitude of the signal. And you might say, well, this is. This is oversimplified, but it's exactly uh, what uh, uh, time frequency decomposition is. This is how to compute a discrete Fourier transform. This is the MATLAB function. This actually, these four lines are actually going to compute your uh, discrete Fourier transform. And here we don't have the uh, cosine and the sine. We just use the exponential. If you remember your classes from high school, uh, you can convert exponential of uh, imaginary number to a cosine and a sine part, and you can convolve it uh, uh, with your signal. So that's exactly what we did, and we loop other frequency, we do all the frequencies, and uh, we can compute our uh, discrete Fourier transform, so the amplitude at each frequency and the phase at each frequency, and all of these numbers here will be uh, complex. Does anybody know the difference between the discrete Fourier transform the numerical difference between the discrete Fourier transform and the fast Fourier transform? I always ask this question. It's, it's, there is, uh, 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 the fast Fourier transform is faster. That's the, that's the <laughs> only numerical uh, difference between the two. It just have uh, the algorithm for the fast Fourier transform is a bit more complex because it uses harmonics between frequencies, so it doesn't have to recompute everything. This, this takes more time to compute because it does every single frequency one by one. 
In the fast Fourier transform, when you have the amplitude at 4 hertz, you have some information about the amplitude at, at 8 hertz, etc. So now we're moving on to uh, how to compute the actual uh, power spectrum. So we could, just, we could just look at these amplitudes over all the frequencies, and we will have uh, the amplitude over frequencies. But uh, what we usually do is that we use a method, which is called the Welsh method. And under um, MATLAB, it's the p-Welsh function that you might have used. And what this function does is that you have your continuous EG signal right here. Uh, you're going to slice the signal into, into blocks, into windows, and you're going to get this time frequency estimate. Here I just represented the real number, and I get a time frequency estimate for this window at a given frequency. Then I get a time frequency estimate for this window, and uh, same frequency. This window, this window, etc. Then I'm going to average the square values of, uh, of the length, and uh, this is going to be give me my power at this specific frequency. And then I redo it uh, for another frequency. I always keep the window the same. I just change the uh, number of cycle here uh, for uh, the tapered uh, sinusoid. I, I can obtain all of my different uh, uh, frequency. So I take the length of the vector, I square the length, and I take the average, and I have uh, my power. If I don't square, I have amplitude. If I square, I have power. So this is what I just said. Uh, you do that a difference. So you here I have three windows. So three windows at 50 hertz, I get my power at 50 hertz. Three windows at 40 hertz, I get my power at 40, 40 hertz, 30 hertz, 20 hertz, etc. What you can also do when uh, you're using um, the P. Welsh method, and the P. Welsh method is not that complex. So you can re-implement it uh, easily just using the FFT function of MATLAB. But you can also implement sort of overlap. So you can say, well, I want 50% overlap between my windows. And basically, it makes your uh, spectrum smoother. Uh, the problem is that, what's the main problem? It's, hmm? it's uh, yeah, well, it's, it's just twice longer to compute. You know, there's twice more windows. So that's, that's, the, main, that's the main thing. I don't think the independence problem here is a real problem because we're doing averages over these windows anyway. We're not doing statistics. And um, a, a last thing you can do with this is called uh, uh, frequency padding. And frequency padding consists in putting zeros on the side. And what this does, so you, you get your window, you extract your window, and then you're going to add zeros and what this does is that it artificially increases your frequency resolution. So if you had your power spectrum with a, a one hertz increment, this is going to give you a power, and you double the size of the window, this is going to give you a power spectrum with 0 0.5 hertz uh, increment. And you could have well tried to smooth your spectrum to get 0 0.5 hertz, but this is just a more elegant way uh, to do the smoothing. Now we're moving to uh, uh, a little bit more complex measures. So we're done with the power spectrum. And uh, the exercise at the end of this presentation is about trying to modulate these numbers and see how it affects uh, the output. And this is really the base of all the time frequency decomposition. In all the software, you're going to see padding, and you're going to see, uh, you're going to see overlap and, and, and things like that. So it's really uh, the very basis. Now what we're doing is that we were averaging these windows across times. And what we can do uh, instead of that is that we can have data trials. And this, is, this was one trial. And we had at 5 hertz. We had 10 hertz, 20 hertz, 30 hertz. And we have all these latencies of windows overlapping or not. And we were just averaging here to get the power at 5 hertz, averaging the square uh, of the of the, of the length of the vectors. And here at 10 hertz, we're uh, doing the same thing, and we're getting our power spectrum. This is the last uh, concept that is important to uh, understand for time frequency decomposition. And most of you probably have heard of the Nyquist frequency. And uh, Nyquist frequency uh, 
tells you that if you want to uh, uh, look at a signal, for instance here, we have a signal at 100 hertz. So this is the uh, thin line right here, 100 hertz. And then we sample at 120 hertz. And intuitively we say, oh, okay, I'm sampling at 120 hertz. I should be able to reconstruct the signal at 100 hertz. I mean, I'm sampling higher frequency after all. But you can see that's not the case because in these samples, I can pass this perfect sinusoid through this sample. So I'm not able to reconstruct the original signal. And uh, the Nyquist frequency tells you that if you want to, uh, if you want to, if you're interested in a signal at 100 hertz, you need to have a sampling frequency of at least 200 hertz. If I have more than 200 hertz for the sampling frequency, then I can reconstruct my signal. If I have less, than 200 hertz, I'm, not, I'm gonna have some information about my signal. I haven't lost everything, but I, I just can't reconstruct uh, this signal. So if you're interested in studying I gamma at 180 hertz, don't record at 250, because you, you, you won't be able to really study what you're uh, interested in. And uh, Scott already showed this picture. This is, this is another representation we can use in each lab where this is all the channels and we can specify some specific time frequency regions to plot the uh, scalp topography. And now we're going to uh, move on for the last uh, 15 minutes onto trying to load the uh, tutorial data set and, uh, and trying these different parameters of overlap, uh, window size, and uh, FFT length, which is the padding. So this is using this function. So you're, you load a data set into EEG lab, and so you use file, load data set, and then you use this menu, which is called uh, channel spectra and maps. And you're going to change these three parameters in, in the last edit box, changing the window size, changing the, uh, the padding, so the length, of the windows padding. So if you have a 256 window size and you use NFFT 512, that means you're gonna, you're gonna use uh, padding in the windows that's twice bigger. And this is the envelope. And it's, it's all in points. It's all in data points. Okay, here we go. And we have, you can, you can read that. We have different types of exercise for people of different levels. <laughs> So uh, you can just use the GUI, or then you can move on to the command line to do more advanced things if you feel comfortable with it. So we have 15 minutes to do these simple things. And, and there, is, there are people. We have, uh, we have lots of helpers. So you just raise your hand. And if you can't start MATLAB, we're going to come help you.